Okay, so this is Stu at Purple Valley and here, this time I'm here with John Scott. And uh, first of all, I want to say, John, thank you very much for letting me join you in the practice this week. A pleasure. And um, I was really struck by the positive energy in the shala and the, the um, reinforcing and just general uplifting feel. And that's generated a lot by yourself and obviously David and Gretchen were here too. But constantly I hear in the shala, you know, um, fantastic, uh, lovely, well done. And it's like really, really like you're invested in every single student. And, uh, and after such a long period of time teaching, that obviously part of your nature, but it's just amazing to see that you've got such an investment every minute while you're in the shala and your work rate is like off the chart, isn't it? And what's going through your minds when you first enter the shala um, for a Mysore practice? And how do you keep so buoyant all of the time? Well, first and foremost, I'll always refer back to Guruji in, in my mind. And so my Mysore mornings are modelled off Guruji. Right. And I'm very fortunate to be one of eight in a class with Guruji. Nice numbers. So I met Guruji in his 70s, and he was full power at 70. Yeah. And he... Um, I, I guess he assumed his role and position as teacher, Guruji, Guru, in a role play, because with further discussions, I understand how he could see roles. Yeah. And so I role play. So, okay. So while, while I'm in class, I'm actually in a role. Yeah. I'm in the teacher's role. Because yeah. remember, I am first and foremost a student myself. Yeah. So I'm a student and a practitioner and I have a joy from my practice which I want others to experience. Yeah. With Guruji, he had a limited, let's say a limited uh, voc range of vocabulary that he used with Western students unless you were like Richard Freeman and had uh, uh, Sanskrit at hand. Right. And I'm not a social person, generally speaking, in terms of numbers. I'm more of a one-to-one -one person. Yeah. But whenever I was one-to-one -one with Guruji, the conversation was never quantitative. It was specific, direct, and most of the times quiet. Yeah. And so I, I guess, too, because I'm more of a spatial person, I'm, a, I'm an observer, I, I really observed Guruji analytically and in those days we were able to sit in the room when we weren't practicing while he was teaching while he was observe. teaching no. there was no cues right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody has not that good. and no. on my first visit with Guruji on my last month I was one of four wow so when I teach at home maximum 10 students in a class yeah so you followed that aspect, uh, like many aspects of the tradition, obviously, but that also acts aspect yeah. of small groups. Yeah. 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 And so you mentioned David and Gretchen too. David yeah. also teaches from home. I think he teaches maximum eight people in his yeah. class. Yeah. Um, because what I want to pass on is the one-to-one -one nature of the teaching that I got from Guruji, yeah. which was a lot of hands-on, a lot of eye contact, yeah. a lot of breath, and just body touch. And did you notice while you were there an, an adaptation for the individual? Because I see that in yourself as well. Um, to did he teach different things to different people? Did he yes. different flows, yes. different counts? Uh, same count, right? But different positioning of their bodies, right? Yes, but same count. But same count. And so same sequencing. So maybe we should start with my first embarrassing moment of the week, which was when you came to me and said, what's the vinyasa count for this? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> forgotten. So can you tell us what it is that's important about the count and why we should be doing it and just flow from there? Because I know you've got loads of stuff to tell us about that. In my first year, second year with Guruji, I did not know that Chatwari, Pancha, Shat yeah. was four, five, and six. Yeah. 
I thought Chitwari was jump back, Puncher was up dog, and Shaq was down dog. Right. I thought they were the translations. Yeah. There was, however, on the notice board a list of posture names and numbers. Ooh, I remember just looking at that and walking on by. Um, I coincided with Lino Miali all of my early years in Mysore. Yeah. And we tried to work it out together at one stage what the numbers meant. But we didn't, still didn't know he was counting. So nobody actually told you at that stage, Guruji didn't come over to yeah. you and say, look, this is what we're doing with the count? Or? Nope. Okay. He may have said counted method. Yeah. But right. never, that's what I mean, his vocabulary never extended. Yeah. Or the way he presented material wasn't in a discourse way. Right. So those were missing parts to yeah. jigsaw puzzles in a sense. We had a, a, a jigsaw puzzle with lots of unknown pieces yeah. or holes. And Lino had been to a Guruji International Workshop in France. Right. And he came back and th that year that I saw him, he said, John, he's counting. And so from that point, um, we then went into the inquiry into the count. Guruji allowed Lino and I, with a clipboard, to do full vinyasa in his class. Yeah. And asked him the vinyasa. He counted it to us. We wrote it down. So at that stage, how did you encounter these bits which there is no count? Because there's occasionally breaths, isn't there, in and out, uh, say, where the count doesn't continue. So did he explain why no, that was? No, he didn't explain it. Okay, so he just so said... So, remember Guruji's s s sort yeah. of saying is, <laughs> do your practice and all is coming. Right, yeah. Now that can be taken so many ways. Yeah. Life's coming at you, you must be practicing to be strong for life coming, yeah. having a technique. Yeah. But if you do do your practice and do the real internal inquiry, yeah. then insights come. And there is that saying, we teach the things we most need to know ourselves. So by taking that role of sharing the practice, yeah. It was in that sharing of the practice that I really started to understand it and learn it. Right. Because then students will ask the exact question you're asking, why is there not yeah. a count here? Yeah. And so as the teacher, I want to be in that position of having a valuable answer or saying, well, I'll try and find that one out. Yeah. And did you ever find out? Why? No, <laughs> not, not directly from Guruji. No. But. Uh, my analysis is that, say for example, if we take Prasarita Padottanasana, yeah. there's five vinyasa, yeah. but in his yoga mala, it says practitioners should note that on vinyasas two and four, extra inhale, extra exhale is taken. Yeah. So Dwe has two breaths, Chatwari has two breaths. Yeah. If you analyze the vinyasa, the body doesn't move. So for a whole breath, the body, the torso, yeah. isn't moving. The arms might move. Right. So from hands to the yeah. floor on Chitwari, yeah. that's an exhale. Yeah. But we haven't moved the torso and then punches come up. So maybe, and it, does that repeat itself in those other times when there's, so for instance, um, uh, Padangastasana and Padahastasana, that's again where there's a breath there, isn't there? Let's go to Adabada Padmottanasana. <laughs> <laughs> the half lotus standing forward bend. Yeah. Has nine vinyasa. Yeah. Often people get dizzy coming out. Femoral arteries being pressed possibly by the ankle yeah. as you fold forward, head below heart. It's a classic place to come dizzy. Yeah. Especially if you just come straight up. Yeah. A so. choreography. So yeah. remember the count as a choreography. And Adabhada Padmottanasana is a good one to learn and, uh, and understand your question. Yeah. Because the choreography, if you go through it, gives you the answer. A combined Dwe fold. Five breaths in Dwe. Trini, open up. Yeah. Then there's an exhale. Technically, the body doesn't move. Yeah. But what's happening there is you've opened up the torso. You then exhale, bend the standing knee. Yeah to go from the hand, a biped of hand and foot, yeah. back to being a monoped. Yeah. 
to come up. Yeah. So there's a point where you open up, you can rebalance the blood, exhale, yeah. you lower a little bit with yeah. still being more or less head above heart. Yeah. And then chatwari come up. Now your chatwari up there, arm and a legs bound. Yeah. You release both a leg and an arm. That's like a body movement. Yeah. Shat straight away left side. Sup to fold. Five breaths. Again, ashto open. Exhale, bend the knee, rebalance so you don't go dizzy. A good proper exhale. Yeah. Another come up. Summer steady is always zero. Yeah. So there's no number for summer steady. So that's why Adabada works out of being. And that nine. and that exhale breath there, that should because I often see that as a lot of people do it really short, but that should be the same length breath as every other breath, shouldn't it? Yeah, that's exactly. in that. That's, yeah. th that's what I'm saying. It's choreographed yeah. there so you don't yeah. go dizzy. Yeah. So there should be a definite pause, a, a visual pause. pause. Yeah. Yeah. And it also provides, you said, like a, a mantra and um, something to focus the mind as you're progressing with the count yeah. throughout so the practice. Why I'm so big on the count yeah. is A, Guruji counted. Yeah. And so it, 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 it was only possibly aware that Guruji counted internationally. Yeah. But in Mysore, in his Shala, in Lakshmi Puram, he counted. He was only counting the vinyasa that he was on with the student that he was going to. So he ne you never heard him complete a full vinyasa. Right. And often you didn't hear him complete a half vinyasa. Because while that person was going through, he was on that adjustment. Right. So you would hear be going ashto nava. Yes. But if you didn't understand the counting, yeah. Yeah. how to count, you didn't know that the vinyasa had a count to it. Right. Now he was counting all the time, and so my analysis is also that Guruji counted for 60 years, plus. So there must have been a reason for it. It yeah. must have been important, yeah. otherwise he would have let it go. Yeah. Now here's the, you've mentioned the word mantra. Yeah. I've taken liberties to call it mantra. It's a Sanskrit number, technically doesn't have any meaning. It's a, it's a, it's a sound yeah. that's repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. And if you keep the count as a constant, and if your mind wanders and you come back to the count, yeah. if your mind wanders and come back to the count, technically it's working or operating like a mantra. Because yeah. it does refocus you, doesn't it? Because then if you, if you go off on a story, you've, you, it tells you you've done that and you've lost the count, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. yeah. And so, also, Guruji did tell me, once when Lino and I had done, started the project, yeah that his exam from Krishnamacharya was specifically that. Krishnamacharya would ask him, uh, Sapta Virabhadra, uh, Suri Namaskar B. Ah. And he would have to say Virabhadrasana. So yeah. he, that's how he was e examined, was yeah. he needed to know the vinyasa. And in a sense, it's like a GPS. Each asana has a name or a destination, yeah. a place to arrive. But you start at zero, you're going to arrive at that place, contemplate that pose, yeah. and return. Yeah. And so, before you've even started the asana, you know exactly where you're going, what you're going to do. So each time I come to samasthiti, yeah. which could be shunya, empty, or infinite potentiality, I also acknowledge Ganesha, which is the removal of obstacles, I'm fresh. I might take a number of free breaths there. Right especially during my second series. I'll be right. doing some free breaths there to rebalance myself so that when I enter the next journey, yeah. I'm not dragging with me the past. Yep. Okay? So, <clears throat> um, at that point, I then name the asana, and with that naming, it's almost like a downloading. First, yeah. you've downloaded the number of vinyasa, yeah. the state of the asana. Yeah. You've also, in that download, say it's Ustrasana. What is Ustrasana? It's a camel. Yeah. And it's going to tell you the story that follows. So it helps you also then to, before you begin, begin the process of empathy. Yeah. What is it to be Utita Trikonasana? Yeah. What is it going to be to be Ustrasana? And so for me, that's really important at the very beginning that you know 
where you're going. Because if this is a self-inquiry, yeah. this practice, to find out who we are or to self-realize, first of all, you've got to know where you are, <laughs> where you've come from. Yeah. These are all the questions you want yeah. to know. Not only who am I, what am I, what am I doing, where am I going, where am I coming, that's all vinyasa. And you mentioned there the, the names of the, the our translations of those names of the postures. And of course, I thought, okay, yeah, look, they've looked at it. Up dog, down dog, yes, that looks like uh, what we see the dogs doing, and up dog and down dog. And then some of these other ones are a little bit more difficult to see. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, yeah, they just sort of think that looks roughly like a camel, so it'll do. But you're saying that there's more to it than just giving it some abstract name, that there is, you, you should be trying to embody some of the essence of that. Yeah, well, just back like, asana. Like, yeah. Take back asana of the yeah. bird. You're trying to embody birdness, yeah. Yeah. where these are usually hands for just taking yeah. or giving. <laughs> it might extend to giving, but usually it's for taking. Yeah. And they hardly ever touch the ground. But when you're doing bakasana, yeah. then of course you're becoming a bird. So these become bird yeah. feet and these become bird legs. Yeah. So your arms morph or they, we shape shift our body, our yeah. human body, into the essence of that which we are emulating and having empathy with it. So what does it feel like to be a bird? Well, these can't be legs then. These have to be wings. Yeah. These have to be feathers. So when uh, you know, uh, maybe I have a, 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 a vivid imagination, <laughs> and so for me, yeah. my imagination helps me remain in a positive place. So when Guruji would see someone struggling and saying, "Oh, too much thinking," or "too much negative thinking," yeah. for me, Patanjali says, "Very really negative thought. Flip it for a positive thought." So for me, if I'm going to have lots of thoughts, let's marshal those to be constructive. Yeah rather than being destructive, yeah. be fanciful, have that joy, that Peter Pan quality, because if you get that Peter Pan quality, then you have got a strength and a lightness to be able to fly. Yeah. And you refer quite often to the, the earth, the trees, the animals, in, almost in that transition yeah. of changing from one to the other yeah. to the other to the other. Because we get locked in hands, arms, yeah. legs, shoulders, we forget that we are the five elements. Yeah. We are made up of the five elements. And so, in order to make different shapes of our body, we've then got to first of all understand the physical nature of it, yeah. its physical weight, its foundation, center of gravity, and moving the center of gravity over the foundation to yeah. get it balanced. You can then start to play with the fact that whatever is the foundation must be earth. Very closely related to earth is going to be water. So when we're doing Utita Hasta Padangostasana, yes. you've got two legs that are a tree trunk. As yeah. soon as you take half of the tree trunk away and hold it up, are you holding up a tree trunk or a branch? Yeah. I'd rather be holding up a branch. You'd rather be a branch. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going to halve your trunk, yeah. you're going to have to shift all of the water of that trunk into the one leg. Yeah. Quite simply, just bend that leg, take the weight out of that one, this one's already starting to firm up more with the water. You just so ass, pull the leg in, then extend your leg out like a branch. So it might be cartoon in terms of a, a, a playful way of looking at something, yeah. but in a sense, if you watch a martial artist, they can root to the ground. Yeah, from any position. Yeah, so yeah. If, we, if we cross culture borrow a little yeah. bit and see that, that they shape shift, yeah. they move, bend, play with the elements. So. You become an earth bender, a water bender. Yeah. And does that translate? Because when, when we watch your practice, it's a very, very light, airy practice. There's no visible, obviously, it's a little bit like a swan, you know, when you see the, the you. thing on the outside and the effort is there is effort there underneath the surface. But is it drawing from those sort of elements that yeah. gives you this lightness of practice? Yeah. Um. I guess I've, uh, at a younger age, I had a fascination with martial arts to start yeah. off with. And I remember seeing an old master on a documentary. He was 70 years of age. And he said, it's taking me 70 years to find chi. 
now I'm going to try and direct it. Yeah. And so the interesting thing with Guruji in his theories, and in the old days we did have a theory class on a Saturday afternoon. In those theory classes, I did glean some interesting information. Yeah. I've lost my train of thought now. You're going to give us all your interesting information that you got from those classes. <laughs> <laughs> Guruji never spoke muscle or bone. No. I never once heard him describe a muscle or a bone. Yeah. And so in Guruji's yoga anatomy, no bones. No. Nadis. Yeah. He went straight to the Nadis, straight to prana. So we're, we're in the Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, you're introduced to the word prana really early. Right. You're introduced to the word bandha really early. Yeah. Mula bandha, to seal yeah. the energy in the body so you don't prolapse it out, you don't yeah. lose it out to earth. So you don't want to earth out like an electricity cable. Yeah. And I see that so to, to your, the lightness or the swan quality yeah. is not earthing out. Yeah. So the Mula bandha's there and the Uddiyana Bandha is to direct it. The Jalanhala Bandha is to monitor it, to meter it, to flow. So for me, these three are always like three links in a chain yeah. together. I don't let them break apart. They're always in relationship. And sometimes you mention also armpit Bandha. <laughs> Where does this, we don't see that in the books very often. Where does that one come from? Actually, I was playing with Hastabanda once, yeah. and a good friend, Hamish Hendry, said, John, it's called Karamule. Right. This part here. Yeah, where well, you can see like a curve. Yeah. yeah. It's called Karamule, the root of the palm. Okay. Ah, so like root again. Yeah, so root again. So in my previous life as a designer, I worked with um, disabled children. Yeah. And one of the clients was not thalidomide, but like the drug thalidomide that stopped limbs growing, yeah. this child had um, not grown limbs in the womb yeah. and just had a bud. We called it a bud. Yeah. So from that experience, I understood that first is the shishumna, yeah. the spine, and then the limbs like a trunk of a tree yeah. branch off. Yeah. So it, we've got five limbs. Central limb with a mullah. If the hand had a mullah karamule, then what would the arm have? A root. Yeah. So just as we've got three main ones here, pelvic floor, abdomen, throat, armpit, elbow, wrist. So I then started to just extrapolate and go, well, every joint basically is an energy center. Yeah. And so I'm, f I'm full on from my design world that form follows function, which is an old Bauhaus movement uh, mm. uh, mantra. Mm. So in my dis studying in my design days, I had a German yeah. tutor, and he shared that with us. And so it, it meant a lot to me. Yeah. In the body, let's say the joints have a function to do. If the joint mobility is severely reduced, restricted due to, to just lack of movement because of the musculature support around it, it's just yeah. too tight or too loose. Yeah. If that joint mobility is compromised, then those shapes that we make will also be compromised. So to get the optimum shape, you need to get optimum or full and free movement of your joints. Mm. So full and free movement, you want healthy joints. And so um, I then searched to get a name for arm <laughs> and I got Baha. Right. Someone else in the Sanskrit world would be like, better correct, <laughs> correct me, please do. Baha Mula Banda. Right. Armpit bundle. Armpit bundle. So for me, the armpit bundle is to draw the armpits towards the navel to kick in, connect into here. Yeah. And then for my armpits to connect to my throat. So it's almost like a kite shape. Yeah. If we were to 
uh, scale that down, yeah. it would be almost then the diamond. Yeah. Like Superman's diamond. We like that idea. Yeah, yeah like we Superman. We could get you a t-shirt. And so the Superman, you know, it's the old serratus muscle. Yeah. So the serratus muscle is my armpit bunda. Yeah. Having engaged that, that's where I'm able to get a little bit lighter in my practice because I'm putting that energy from my armpits down through to my hands. And that's where that control of the lifts up and down come yeah. in, the vinyasas and the... So, just to add in here, that David, Kyle and myself yeah. have actually worked for 15 years together. Yeah. So we've been friends and colleagues for 15 years and the way we relate and our relationship's lovely is because we banter backwards and forwards. Yeah, throw concepts between we, each other. Yeah, and so... What I've discovered in my body were not having the anatomical knowledge. Yeah. David then goes, well, that's correct anatomically. Yeah. And he's able to, um, in his academia world of anatomy, yeah. start going, well, John, there's this, 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 this. And then, of course, that extrapolates in my head as well. And the yeah. two of us brainstorm and we come up with um, a new understanding of yeah. how our bodies work. Yeah. And so for me, then, there must be a groin bunder. And so what happens is if you've got your mullah out to your groins and yeah. back to your to your your udi, yeah. and then out to your armpits and back to your throat, yeah. in a sense we're then through those cross lines connecting. If we just drew lines of intersection yeah. like nadis, yes. then we would actually get mullah, swadasana, manipura, uh, anahata. Yeah intersects the shushumna through here. So if you think of a kite yeah. down to that navel, crossbar across there to the armpits, that would be the heart chakra. Yeah. But I discovered it because I have a little sequence that I call the, the um, baby sequence. Okay. Basic babies or fundamental foundation opening. And if you're in the cat and you go into a real sort of a meditative sort of internal inquiry and you knead the floor like a cat, like a does. cat would yeah you feel your right arm swelling the armpit yeah. when i put my left one down i feel a shift right to my navel and as i change across the shift back through the navel so i feel this diagonal shift through here so the discoveries are because that we go into a place of real focus and invest and the willing to explore so let me tie in the count again. Yeah. Usually we're just full of random thoughts outside the context of our practice. Yeah. So that's random and that's just everyday ordinary ordinary thinking mind. Yeah. And when we're in our ordinary thinking mind, we're not really connected to that which we're doing. It's doing something else. Yeah. And that which we're doing is ordinary. If, however, you turn that around and have a technique that brings you into focus, yeah. for me, the count, the breath, is my number one focus. That then cuts out the unnecessary thoughts. So I then become really involved in my subject matter. Yeah. That dives me even deeper to my subject technical. I'm still counting. I'm still thinking, I've got yeah. a lot of activity going on there, but it's all specific to my inquiry. Yeah. And then, if I keep, keep going in and keep the mantra going, I might go subject specific and just be counting my breath. Yeah. But there are moments where I have lots of insightfulness because nothing else is out of the, in, in the way. So, what happens is you transcend you transcend your ordinary thinking mind. If you transcend your ordinary thinking mind, then you see things extraordinary. They are extraordinary. So my armpit's extraordinary. Rather than ordinary. Rather than ordinary. Yeah. My hand's extraordinary, rather yeah. than ordinary. I see it now as being more like when, if you think of a child, it's not until about uh, 18 months to two years that the part of the brain called the hippocampus starts to file the experience. After that, we reference back to those memory files. 
So there's memory, and with memory there's emotion, so close. Then there's associations, assumptions and projections. So in our ordinary thinking mind, we're going back to some past experience or some re past referencing. We make associations, we make assumptions, and that's what we then project out that reality. Prior to that age, the baby is in total sensation. The senses are fully alive in terms of what they're experiencing. Yeah. And we can't really say that when they look at their hands, that they're not just seeing balls of light. Yeah. Like Neo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the Matrix. <laughs> yes. You know, when we see a baby, they are so awake. Yeah. With their eyes. With absorption. With absorbing yeah. everything. And then that slowly gets sort of shut down, shut down, shut down. And so, for me, again, coming back to the, the count, and the count acting as a mantra, that mantra then takes me into a place where I'm absorbed, yeah. as you're saying. I'm absorbed in my practice. I'm either having a practice that is exploratory and, and revelationary, or it's just super focused. Yeah. And that count, it starts before the in-breath. How does it situate itself? Because I know when I've been trying to do it the last few weeks now, I've been, it seems to be lasting somehow all of the inhale, but that's not what it's meant to, not meant to happen, is it? It's meant to be the count yeah. first, sort yeah. of. So yeah. where is it coming? Is it coming at the end of the exhale or? or uh, Let's look at it the, the, the different way. I'm thinking, I'm think, I like to reference back to movies, and I'm thinking yeah. of the Iron Lady. Meryl Streep playing... Yeah, you've gone back too far for me. Meryl Streep playing, <laughs> playing uh, Margaret Thatcher. Oh, yes. Remember, she's, she's, yeah. now she's, she's, she's old, she's got Alzheimer's, and the doctor comes to see her, and the doctor keeps on asking her how she's feeling. And she gets really cross with the doctor. And she says, stop asking me what I'm feeling. Please ask me what I'm thinking. She said, it's a man's thoughts that really impress me. <laughs> she says, because you watch your thoughts. Yeah. Your thoughts will become your words. And your words will become your actions. And it doesn't really go with Margaret Thatcher. Where have we heard that before? We've actually heard it from another state leader. Gandhi. Yeah. And where did Gandhi get it from? The Bhagavad Gita. So let's look at that because that's really the philosophy, the, within the, the philosophy it tells us what comes first. The thought. Or the seed. Right. So there's the seed. So from the seed comes the thought, from the thought comes the word, from the word comes the action. From the action plants the next seed yeah. for that cycle to go again. So let's enter into that and go, okay, breath wasn't included there. Most practitioners, unfortunately, their precedence, the way they learn and start this practice yeah. is all wrong. Completely wrong. And I was guilty of that myself when I first started sharing the practice until the Lino and myself experience yeah. happened. Most people start with the body first and then add breath to it. Right. Okay. It's the other way around. It's the breath that moves the body. Yeah. Not the body that moves the breath. If you go to the gym, that's the body moving yeah. the breath. Yeah. They then do a number of reps and then they regulate their breath. Yeah. They don't realize it's the breath that actually moves the body. Yeah. So the yogis then ask, well, what is it that moves the breath that moves the body? So it's the breath within the breath, which is the prana. The prana that moves the breath that moves the body. What's prana? Prana is, let's say, life force, and let's just call it energy for simplicity. For me, it's light. Yeah. It's light information. It's intelligence. It's information. So it's a thought that moves the prana, that moves the breath, that moves the body. 
and we can test that quite simply. I remember being a small child running the gauntlet, going out the back door, the kitchen, down to the rubbish bin in the dark to put the rubbish in the dark. Oh, before the boogeyman got you. Before the boogeyman got you, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you'd feel the shivers up your spine. Yeah. So the thoughts were controlling my nervous system. Yeah. My nervous system was already firing into the, the sympathetic fight fight response. Yeah. So it's our thoughts. Thinking Guruji saying, too much negative thinking. Mind here. Yeah. Bring mind here. So I'm using this description to say that really it's you only need to think the number. Yes. Think the number, breathe. Yeah. So it's it's number first. Number comes yeah. first. So if you if you call re recall Guruji counting, Akam, inhale, arms up, yeah. Dway, exhale, fold forward. Yeah. You might have get a drishti in there sometimes. Yeah. Akam, inhale, arms up, look thumbs. Yeah. Dway, exhale, fold forward, head in. Yeah. Nose. Okay, so if you look at that order, if you analyze all the way through a whole Guruji class, yeah. sometimes it might change, but that would be the general rule. Yeah. Number, breath, action, looking place. Yeah. We could make that into columns. Number, breath, action, looking place. Four columns. A looking place drops away. The action drops away. All we then have is number, breath. Number breath. So sometimes you just hear Guruji going, Akim inhale, Dway exhale. Yes. Once the looking place is learnt, once the body knows what it's doing, all we're doing is breath and mantra. Yeah. It's a dynamic pr mantra. It's a dynamic meditation. This is transcendental Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. <laughs> it's just a meditation. Yeah moving so yeah. I used to pontificate and say this was a movement meditation but yeah. I didn't know how how, right. how to describe it yeah. how, what was the key what was the real technique yeah. and so through practicing practicing and teaching and teaching all of a sudden through the years the comings yeah. come or the coming to understand yeah. how this happens and so what happens for, for Guruji for those 60 years how did he know where people were the names of the people the postures that they'd missed out yeah. Where, how, how he knew they had illnesses of things that they hadn't told him. Yeah. Because he was in that place. Yeah. So the count is twofold. The count keeps the teacher focused. The count keeps the teacher neutral. In summer, equal. Yeah. And so that original question you asked me, how do I keep alive in the class, yeah. is I'm counting. Right. So if I'm counting, I'm not going into my ordinary thoughts saying, it's three hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. what am I going to have for lunch? Yeah. yeah. So if I go into that place three hours and lean against the wall and put my foot against the wall and yeah. just watch for a moment, yeah. am I not exiting out? Yeah. Dropping back into ordinary state thinking. If I then enter into ordinary state thinking, I'm going back to memory associations. Yeah. I'm going back to my story. But there's an absorption, isn't there, from your point of view of everything around you, because you always seem to be in the right place at the right time when somebody needs you. So Maybe not in this group. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a big group, isn't it? Yeah. It's a big group. Maybe. So, yeah, yeah, in the ideal world. But yeah. you're, so you're not necessarily, you are observing, but at a, at a subliminal level maybe, because you're counting, but that yes. information is still it's coming, coming in. into you. There's so much information coming yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I, I, I gather what happens then is your ordinary filters aren't there. Yeah. So you're not overlaying your own experiences onto what you're seeing. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so without putting your filters there, yeah. if you take your filters down, yeah. then you're getting a, a, a more direct line yeah. perception of what's actually going on in the room. Yeah. So if I rewind you for a sec and say, so I have been like saying those numbers to myself, which is why yep. they've been being dragged out, really. Yep. So it's really just a thought. Is it, would it be better for it if it was just the thought of a number? Yeah, and then the breath follows. Rather than saying the breath yeah. follows, yeah. yeah. And you were saying that, if, again, we're, we take you back in this idea that 
there is a better way of learning than the way that most people have learnt yeah. the practice. Yeah. So that would be... Well, that goes hand in hand with what you're with saying yeah. too, because mantra, especially in transcendental meditation mantra, is mm. whispered in your ear. Yeah. Okay, so you, you get it whispered in your ear. But Guruji was counting it out aloud. He was transmitting it aloud. Yeah. Akam, Dway, Trini. So what ends up happening is you s I get my beginner students to do that. I call that with voice. Yeah. If you voice it as you practice, you're going to compromise your breath for sure. Yeah. And you will lose <laughs> your attachment to the shape and the form of the postures and the the movements, transitions that you're doing, yeah. which is great. It's good to do that, to put it the other way around. Yeah. You know, that body, first, breath, second, mind, third. <laughs> we're flipping it completely around. Mind, breath, body. If you were a jugger, juggler, you're trying yeah. to juggle the mind ball, followed by a breath ball, followed by a body ball. Yeah. So anyway, by voicing it first, you'll then find that as you walk back up the path that you might be going, hey, come on, do I dream? You'll whisper it. Yeah. That's it starting to go in. So first by voice, mantra. Yeah. Second, whisper it. Yeah. Third, think it. Yeah. So you're trying to think it. You yeah. might need to take a step back, yeah. voice it. Yeah. As you do it, exp really express it, somatize it that way. Then close the mouth, get back into the breath, start thinking it. Yeah. And as the same with getting a mantra, it then starts to rise by itself when you know it. So I know the count. Yeah. I just stand on my mat and it arises. Yeah. So I now hear it. As opposed to voicing it, whispering yeah. it, thinking it, I now hear it, yeah. which means you know it. It, is, yeah, it has become it's, in there. it's become you. Yeah. Otherwise, you're getting oh, yeah. What was the one yeah. after this one? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I can now say I've been counting over twenty years. Yeah. Yeah, because you can move around the room, and you've gone from maybe helping somebody in a supta kamasana adjustment counting there and then all of a sudden you're here and somebody's already into the second and they're doing Ustrasana and you know the count they're on straight away. Straight away. Yeah. Because it's it's in there. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're working, let's say, on a heightened level of awareness. Yeah. You've used a technique to get there. Yeah. And you mentioned a little bit earlier about movement of energy and the chakras we, we mentioned, and you talk a lot about uh, the movement of energy in the spine and that flow of energy up and down and how that should influence maybe our, well, obviously all the asanas, but in particular maybe the forward folds and the back bends. And you have a certain way of teaching uh, back bends that a lot of people I've talked to have found very advantageous, in particular drop backs. And you're talking about this flow of energy forwards and backwards. Can you just explain a little bit? about that for us? First of all, back bending is not normal, natural. Yeah. And so our nervous system tells us that. And so I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to trick the nervous system or positively reprogram the nervous system to accept it. I also understand that the pattern of patterns is inhalation, exhalation or exhalation, inhalation. And the body fits into that pattern. In simplicity, exhalation. Yeah. The sun's gone behind a cloud, flower closes. Sun comes from out behind a cloud, body opens. Yeah. So let's say this is an exhalation pattern, the inhalation pattern. Yeah. Exhalation pattern, inhalation pattern. So I've also listened to Guruji going head down, head up, head down, head up, and looked at the relationship of what the head up, head down is to breath. Yeah. And then being more, even more specific. So the head is up on inhalation and the head is down on exhalation. In synchronicity of that, the head is up last on the inhalation yeah. and first on the exhalation. 
So that would translate into what you've had us doing with the with the up dog and, and then the, the chaturanga. Dog. Up yeah, dog, so, down dog. so up yeah. dog down dog is a really important transition. Yeah. A lot of people stay caught in what I call the inhalation pattern. Yeah. So then this is all stress related. This yeah. is all stress. We're caught up in stress. Yeah. So we get caught in the inhalation stress pattern. Yeah. And so often there's lots of neck and shoulder stuff that yeah. comes to class. And I see it all held in the head. Yeah. And so up dogs happening from the head. Yeah. And down dogs ha happening from the head. And it's nothing's changing. Yeah. And so for me it's becoming, as you said, fluid. Being fluid in the spine so that it's flowing. Yeah. And so on the inhalation it's the heart moving, following by the head. And on the exhalation it's the head. Now as my head tucks like this, look at my navel. Yeah. It goes in. Yeah. And so that then means my psoas is doing the lift when I'm doing from my up dog to down dog transition. Yeah. I know, uh, um, just before you go on to the next bit, I know when you've adjusted me in that transition from the up dog to the down dog, there's quite a dynamic tucking of the head and yeah. the lifting. Yeah, my hands the on the back of your head, my hands yeah. on your navel, and I go like that. Like that, yeah. So when, when we're on our own, are we still looking for yes. that quite a sharp dynamic yeah. movement? Yeah, it's, yeah. A s it's a switch. Okay. Yeah. So because quite often it's like yeah. the movements are quite slow and... and yeah. Particularly on the coming up, shall we say. But then we change a little bit of tempo with the tucking. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. And remember the tempo, the change of tempo. Yeah. Means that the inhalation, exhalation of the transitions vary. Right. So technically speaking, in the vinyasa, yeah. the movements to an asana and out of an asana yeah. fluctuate according to... The, let's say the load on the body. Okay. Chitwari jumping back is a mm -hmm. is much different to Akim. Yeah. So especially at the beginning stages, they yeah. can't be the same length. Right. Because yes, so maybe I'll draw you out on this because, but then if you're thinking okay, movement follows breath, then a, a meter breath would be the same and you would have to adapt your movement to yes, fit but into the, the meter the, breath. The, the, yeah, so don't meter the breath. Okay. It's got to be free breathing. Guruji was always saying free breathing, don't hold the breath. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Aikam is going to be shorter than Chatwari. Chatwari has got to be quite explosive, but you've got to jump it back. You can't hold Chatwari's breath. No, but you could draw it out longer. And Only if the body matches the breath. Okay. Okay, what comes first, chicken or the egg? Yeah. But then we Stiff send the body, chicken. get the breath moving, yeah. get the heat going, warm it up, loosen yeah. the body up. Yeah. And then the breath will start stretching. Look yeah. at Surya Namaskar A and B. First A, yeah. you could say it's a one one uh, it's a one one ratio. There's ten breaths in the downward dog. Yeah. And there's ten breaths that are dynamic. Yeah. Okay, it's nine vinyasa. Samasthiti. There's five breaths in downward dog. Yeah. Both inhale and exhale. Yeah. Makes ten. And the ten dynamic. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Ten dynamic, ten static. Yeah. That would be a one one ratio. Yeah. So it's quite even. That's just getting the body moving. And then if you look at Surinamaskar B, seventeen yeah. to five. Yeah. Okay, five in the downward dog would make that ten. Yeah. So then it's seventeen to ten. We could almost make it say twenty, 20 to, ten. to yeah, ten. Two to one. Two to yeah. one. Yeah. So it's even more free breathing happening in Surinamaskar B plus that stretch into the the Virabhadrasanas. You get the breath going in A, B, it's more dynamic and it's it's uh, challenging a little bit more. So if you're free breathing, how do you make sure that the movement isn't dictating the breath and that the breath is leading the movement? Yeah, that you don't hold the breath. But uh, just by drawing it, without holding, but drawing it longer or shorter. Yes, or yes. So that's okay. Yeah, yeah okay. you can't just go... No. Yeah, so you yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So you are doing that, but my body can accept that. Yeah. But if it's only to here... Yeah. Yeah, but it's not. Yeah.
but sometimes it takes longer. So you could say, okay, it takes longer to get from uh, down dog to step forward into Virabhadrasana yeah. than it does to, to go back down. Yeah. yeah. So do you move quicker, keep the same length of breath and move quicker to match it to the breath, or do you draw the breath out because it takes longer to get there you're not holding your breath or anything like that, but then you're really matching the breath to the movement because it takes that lot. You can see where I'm trying to yeah, drag so you, <laughs> kicking uh, and screaming? From personal experience, <laughs> when I was a beginner, yeah. I could not draw the breath out. Right. And I think I was probably a little bit OCD or pedantic when I was exploring vinyasa. Yeah. And at first I thought vinyasa meant breath movement. Right. For every breath there was a movement. Yeah. So I went really analytical and I analyzed that to get into warrior there was extra movements. Yeah. So I would get to downward dog, I would inhale, turn my back foot, exhale, step forward, and then I'd inhale into the warrior. Right. So I was actually Added adding in. Yeah. I did that for the first two years of my practice. Wow. And Guruji never told me off or never said anything. Yeah. He must have heard me taking extra breaths, yeah. but what I wasn't doing was holding my breath. Yeah. Now, I have a bit more of an overlap. On my Chitwari, for example, I land in a high plank, yeah. still exhaling, press down, yeah. still exhaling, roll over the toes, yeah. and I'm here before I start inhaling. I'm already a third into my puncture before I start inhaling. Interesting. So when we, when we transition from the Surya Namaskars, A's and B's, yeah. then we're into our standing postures, and then we're into the seated postures, is there an, a natural change in the rhythm of the breath because of the intensity of the postures, like the in seated are more intense than the standing, shall we say? So would you expect to see the breath shorten because of that intensity, or stay roughly the same tempo as you set up in the Surya Namaskars when you first started your thing, if you have that ability to draw your breath out. Yeah, let's say there is more, I'm inquiring into this myself at the moment, and what is the relationship, what, how does it relate to the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system? For simplicity, let's just say the dynamic activates the sympathetic nervous system and the static activates the parasympathetic nervous system. There would be a balancing there. Yeah. And then when we looked at A being 1-1 one, one, yeah. and we looked at B being 2-1, yeah. it actually had the, uh, the sympathetic nervous system up more. more yeah. So therefore, it was heating the body. It was yeah. getting that going. Yeah. Then when you get down onto the um, uh, the seated asanas, let's say Janusha asana, for example, it's really interesting. Yeah. Twenty-two vinyasa. Yeah. That's one one again. Five on right side, five on left side. Yeah. That's ten and ten. ten. Twenty. Yeah. Twenty-two vinyasa. Yeah. And you do notice that that is a very relaxing posture, isn't it? Well, if you do yeah. the full vinyasa, yeah. if you see, if you do the full vinyasa, you yeah. are balancing yourself out. Yeah. If you're only doing half, yeah. then um, you could be rest and digest too much, yeah. going the other way, meaning yeah. the breath gets too long, too slow, yeah. and you lose the plot. Or, if it's more of a beginner person, you're not bringing them back to vertical to really rebalance before they start on adding another one yeah. on top. Because you don't see that many people doing full vinyasa, do you? But I, I know you, you encourage it, and, and particularly between, say, those, that little, our little camel train in, yeah. in the second sequence. Um, so you would encourage people to come up to standing, so and, and perhaps you can explain then also that's why the count is the count when you're not coming up. 
when you're not coming up, you're overlapping two counts. Yeah. And so I describe it as Guruji describes it, mala. Right. Each asana, you could make a mala. So I made for the group some malas. Right. I bought some um, japa mala beads, and I then threaded them. Or sorry, cut them. Yeah. Got the big ones and the small ones, and I threaded them to show how each posture is like a mala. Yeah. So, for example, trikonasana, you would have two big beads which represent the right side and the left side. Yeah. And you have another three beads that are slightly smaller that are the vinyasas between. And you have one extra long one which represents samastidhihi. So in, in the mala of Utita Trikonasana yeah. A, there's six beads. The sixth bead, or the zero bead, is the guru bead, or shunya, or empty. Yeah. Akam, a little bead, to be counted and meditated on. Dwe, a bigger bead, the flower of the mala, that would be the pushpa mala. And you contemplate that flower for five breaths. Trini, a smaller bead, coming up out of yeah. right side. Chatwari, left side, trikonasana, bigger bead again, that would be a flower. We contemplate that one for five. Puncha come up, a little bead, yeah. samastiti. So each one has a full vinyasa. Yeah. Each, and Eddie Stern did a beautiful um, forward in Guruji's Yoga Mala book. Yeah. It says, sacred as a prayer, each bead, or each vinyasa is like a bead to be counted and meditated on. Um, as beautiful as a pushpamala, that is to adorn the gods or to adorn the, the deities, each asana is like a flower strung on the thread of the breath. Yeah. And so Guruji's own metaphor was to, to state that every vinyasa was like a bead on a necklace that was to be counted and meditated on for meditation. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, by doing the full vinyasa, especially when you're doing difficult postures, yeah. it brings you to a place of zero where you can rebalance, take as many extra breaths as you want yeah. to then start the next one. Yeah. If you're at a level where you come up to a full vinyasa and you're not short of breath, then yes, you could then link them together. Yeah. So you could then do, say, Janu A, B, C together. Yeah. See how that goes and then finish that as a full vinyasa. Yeah. Yeah. So my compromise is to group the asanas and do a full vinyasa. Right. So always still coming up to something. For me as a teacher, it always gives me an opportunity, A, to check colour. Right. How much the, how much effort is going into it. Yeah. What's the colour of the, the student's face when yeah. they're standing there? Yeah. How are they panting? Yeah. Are they panting? If they're panting, stand here, just rebalance. Yeah. It's a good t place to say, well, this is where you finish. Yeah. So you can do that and monitor that when you do have smaller classes. Because remember now, I'm, yeah. I'm usually... Dealing with like maximum yeah, 10, so 12. All, all of my yeah. main workshops, I, on my own I'll do 10 maximum yeah. students on my own. Yeah. If, I've, if I'm working with Lucy, we might go up to 12. Yeah. On a rare occasion, 15 yeah. between two of us. Yeah. Um, on my own, 10. It's hard work. Yeah. It was David Kyle that set up three batches of 10. <laughs> so when we travel, we go to a, our yeah. students' shalas. Yeah. We'll do 30 students a day, yeah. three batches of 10. Nice. Yeah. Now, we could do one class of 30. Yeah. But it's nowhere in the same attention. But I had yeah. this, this attention from yeah. Guruji. Yeah. And the quality of my practice is because of, I can honestly say that Guruji adjusted me in every one of my asanas. Wow. Yeah. And that's rare. So with that generation of us, we got Guruji adjusting us in every pose. We also got to watch Guruji adjust people in every pose. As you said, there was also seeing the variance that he had on each person. And so, when I'm working with someone, I'm adjusting like Guruji. I'm doing what did it feel like on my body. 
then by working on having the privilege of working on many bodies, I see all the variants. Yeah. And you know, Kermasana, Supta Kermasana. There's those legs that are way lateral, and there's those legs that are way medial. That's just two groups, say, for example. Yeah. And you start to see those categories. I think we've got to stop you, John. I mean, we've only just scratched the surface, haven't we? We could keep <laughs> you going till tea time. Um, but, you know, thank you so much for, for spending the time with us. And uh, they're frantically waving at me in the background. So, <laughs> But it's like fantastic, you know. Thanks so much for sharing with us. Cool, man. <laughs>